Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We are going to be talking all about bats with Dr. Joy O'Keefe, and but before we get to uh, Joy, we have to introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local food, small farms educator, Katie Parker in Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are things in Macomb today? Cold and windy. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that full spring really got me earlier on in this month and so, but but yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Have you planted any um, cool season crops outside? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Katie, you reminded me, I left a flat of stuff outside last night. Uh-oh, what did you leave it's, out? <laughs> so it's lettuces and chard. Maybe it'll be all right. Uh, yeah. We'll see. I mean, it's meant for this type of weather, right? I will find out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I had drainage holes in the bottom of the flat, so I took it outside to water, and then I, I left it out there. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> we'll find out later today if they survived the right? last night's cold. So, yeah, but I'm going to be getting tomatoes started here next week, so I'm excited yeah. about that. I yeah. hope to get in the greenhouse this week and get some started, so it's an exciting time of year. Definitely, definitely. And someone who I know is getting some seeds going is horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. I do. I started tomatoes and peppers last week, some zinnias, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> Nothing outside yet. Every time I think I can get out and do it, it's going to be in the 20s again. So, yep. Still hardening stuff. I, yeah, and that's what I didn't do with the seedlings yesterday. So they're probably not hardened off and they're probably toast right now. So we will, uh, oh man, ah, that's some good lettuce too. So uh, Ken had recommended the crazy drunken headed lettuce or something, right? Um, the big frilly top Red, lettuce. Yeah, stuff, yeah. uh, I can't remember the exact name. That's the only reason was, I grew it. Yeah, I mean, it's like 20 words in the name. So I... I I got those seeds and that is a flat of that stuff plus the Swiss chard. So, uh, hmm. all right, we'll see if I will update everybody next week to let you know if it survives. So let us grow fast. You know, let's start. That, that's true. And I had lots of seeds. So yeah, that, that will work. Uh, well, Ken, Katie, I'm curious, either of you have, have either of you had to deal with bats in the past? Yeah, we had them really bad in college. The place where I li lived, we had them in the attic, and it was so bad that the apartment that it was over, they had bat bugs in their apartment from the bats, I guess. Oh. Um, and we would find them in the hallways and whatnot, but they finally had to hire somebody to remove them. When I go for evening runs or walks, you can see them dart down around the park. I'm sure they love the insects around the ball diamond lights mm -hmm. so. a few years ago we had one in our kids room so i got a towel and grabbed it and let it go outside and then at university of florida they have big bat houses so that's a big thing to go out in the evenings and watch them all fly out over the lake and stuff so we do that every once in a while while we were down there i'd say we grew up you know, bats kind of uh, all over. We had, I mean, we had a small farm, so uh, bats everywhere. I would say the the memory I have most is we had a cat. His name was Fred. And uh, I remember Fred running across the backyard and a bat was over his eyes and covering his whole face. He couldn't see what was happening. And he was running back and forth. And this bat was just plastered itself to his face. And uh, the bat got away. Uh, and Fred, <laughs> I don't think he ever messed with a bat again. So, um yeah, but to we have so there's so many things to know about bats. It's such a fascinating creature, and to learn more about bats, uh, we are joined today by our special guest, Dr. Joy O'Keefe. Uh, Joy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, we are happy to have you here. Now, I have to let you know, Joy. Uh, we, I don't think we've ever met, but I've heard so much about you. So your your reputation is definitely. Uh, are spreading around uh, Illinois uh, just in, in your, your knowledge, your skill with bats, wildlife in general. So um, we're so excited to have you on the show today. That's great. That's good to hear. Yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. So you are a professor at University of Illinois. Is that correct? 
That is correct. I am an assistant professor in natural resources and environmental sciences, and I am the first ever wildlife extension specialist that Extension and the university have hired uh, to talk to people in Illinois about wildlife. And um, my primary experiences with wildlife have been with bats. I've been studying bats for about 22 years now. But I also have a fair bit of experience with reptiles and amphibians, uh, birds, and just other you know, types of wildlife, mostly in my personal endeavors, not any research capacity. But I've been kind of broadly trained as a wildlife biologist. So I'm excited to be here and uh, really like getting out and seeing what's going on in Illinois. And I've been working in the Midwest for quite a while before I came to U of I Extension. I was, or U of I and Extension, I was at, at a university in Indiana, Indiana State University. And so I worked there for about nine years at Indiana State University and then came over here. So I've, I've been in the Midwest for a fair amount of time now. Well, we are so happy you're here with us, and I, I don't know, it feels like maybe I just wasn't aware of things as a kid, but I, I grew up in Illinois, but it feels like, in terms of wildlife, it feels like things are happening here in the state. Um, things are changing, hopefully for the better. Um, uh, I know we have a lot of work to do, so uh, yeah, I, I'd say let, let's dig into bats today. So Katie, could you uh, start us off on our questions for this week? Yeah, definitely. So Obviously, today our topic is about bats. What's so special about bats and why would we want them around or why are they so important? That is a great question and there's a lot of ways to answer that. Uh, so bats are, bats are mammals, just like you and me. So that's one thing that's awesome about bats because mammals are pretty awesome and mammals live in, you know, most, uh, well, every continent and we have uh, bats on all but one continent. So there's there's a lot of uh, places in the world where we have bats. There's over 1,400 different species of bats and quite a bit of diversity in bats. So bats are second to rodents in terms of diversity. So when we think about rats and mice, there's a little bit more diversity in that group of mammals than there is in bats. But when you look at bats, you have the tiniest bat, the bumblebee bat found in Thailand that weighs only two or three grams. And then you have the largest bat, which is a flying fox, a Malaysian flying fox that can weigh a few pounds. And these uh, bats have very different habits, you know, in terms of what they eat. We see bats that most bats eat insects, but there are quite a few other things that bats eat, uh, nectar and pollen and fruit. And some bats eat other bats, some bats eat birds. Uh, just three species of bats uh, eat blood or consume blood. And so there's, there's a wide variety of bats with really cool facial features and just their, their sizes and shapes and colors are really neat. And of course, bats are the only flying mammal. So they're the only mammal capable of true powered flight. And that's awesome in of itself. It means that they can go places that we can't. So it's really fun to study them because I get to go to new places that I wouldn't have been before. And in Illinois in particular, we want bats around because they do eat insects. A single bat can consume massive quantities of insects in a night. Some have estimated that they might consume their entire body mass in insects in a night. That probably doesn't happen all the time, but they do eat quite a lot of insects. You know, they consume more than we would consume if we were eating, you know, a pile of food in a night. And they have pretty fast metabolism, so they're moving. Uh, those nutrients through and processing them, and they actually uh, can be important for uh, putting nutrients back into the environment after they've consumed insects. But they eat some of our important pests like mosquitoes. Uh, we've found that a number of bats do eat mosquitoes. First, we assess that via uh, microscopic analysis of what they were eating, and we kind of had a hint, but mosquitoes don't really pass through the gut very well, so it wasn't really clear how much they ate mosquitoes. But now a number of molecular studies where we look at the DNA in their guano have shown that bats are eating mosquitoes and, and a variety of bat species are eating mosquitoes. They also eat crop pests like the corn earworm moth, which is an important uh, uh, herbivore eating corn. And then they also eat forest pests like small moths and beetles that are consuming some of our forest trees. So bats are really important on all those fronts. And then they're just also really cool. As I mentioned, they have all these unique features. And so it's just really neat to have them as part of our fauna. 
you mentioned some of the benefits, particularly eating insects, which depending on your perspective may be a good or a bad thing. Um, <laughs> but um, what can we do if, you know, if we want to attract bats to our, our yards and our landscapes, what are some steps we can take to do that? Yeah, so that's a great question too. If you want to attract bats to your yard, I would definitely advise that you do things to promote more insect diversity in your yards. And that could be uh, putting out plants, ideally native plants that are going to be the host to various insect species and that will have blooms or um, you know attractive features to insects throughout the year. So that during the time when bats are active, say, uh, mid-March to uh, probably the end of October, that bats will be able to forage around your yard. Even a small yard can support a healthy bat population because you can talk to your neighbors about planting native plants and trying to attract insects. And then, you know, the bat can just forage right up and down your street, just as if a trick-or-treater is out on Halloween going from house to house. And of course, if we're trying to get bats to you know, forage in our yards and eat our insects, then we're going to want to think about uh, not putting pesticides on plants that are going to potentially be harmful to the bats. Because as I mentioned, a bat can consume quite a lot of insects in a night. And so those pesticides can accumulate pretty rapidly in the bat's tissue and can be harmful to their reproduction or even to their survival. So we want to keep, you know, clean uh, environments for bats that um, have a lot of different opportunities for foraging. The other thing that you can do to try to uh, attract bats to your yard is to actually provide them with roosting opportunities. And some people do that via bat houses, and I could talk more about that if you would like, but there are other things that you can do to provide natural roosting spaces for bats. So there's kind of two broad classes of bats. There's bats that roost in cavities or crevices in trees. And they could use a dead branch in the oak tree in your backyard, or they could use the hollow in the side of the beech tree, uh, whereas other species roost in the foliage of trees and they just hang amongst the leaves. And so if you have trees in your backyard, you're gonna be providing habitat for those bats. I had a friend who tracked a small tricolored bat, which is one of the smallest bats that occurs in Illinois. And they were tracking it via airplane from Tennessee to see where it went when it emerged from its cave during the springtime, right about now. And they tracked this bat via plane to a backyard in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> so this bat just made a beeline from the cave to a backyard in Atlanta, Georgia. And I don't know exactly what these people were doing in their backyard that made it so attractive to the bat, but the bat you know, made a beeline for that yard as if I have been here before, this is a good spot. And bats are actually pretty faithful to their habitats. They'll come back year after year. Some species are quite long lived. There's records of bats living over 30. Uh, in Russia, there's a bat that's lived over 40 years now. So they may show, uh, you know, year to year fidelity to your backyard. So keeping some features there that make it possible for them to roost and to forage is important. That's really interesting. So this coming back to um, like their, their breeding, their roosting spaces, and they're being kind of faithful to those locations. So that takes me to bats in the house. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I know a lot of people sometimes have a reoccurring problem with, with bats in, in the background or in their, in their house. Um, so what are they doing in like our attic? And if that is kind of their habitual uh, place to roost over winter or whatever it is, how can we discourage that? Sure, that's a great question too. So bats are going to roost in places that are stable, safe environments. And what is happening is when a bat is coming out of hibernation right about now in March or April, they're going to the summer landscape wherever they want to go and forage for insects. And then also if it's a female, this is where she's going to rear her pups. And uh, some bats only have one pup, some have multiple, but they, they will, females will form what we call a maternity colony. So a group of bats roosting together. And they, they like to choose spaces where they can be warm, safe, and uh, that are near good foraging resources, right? Where they can go out and get insects every night, especially if they need to forage a lot. And so uh, they historically, all the bats that live in Illinois, with the exception of just a couple of species, they would move from caves in the winter to trees in the summer. 
and they would just go back and forth between the caves and the trees. But of course, we've cut down a lot of trees. We do that when we build our neighborhoods um, and other developments. And sometimes bats come back to where they were historically roosting and the trees are gone. They're going to move into the next best structure. And oftentimes that's a building. And buildings are really attracted to bats because they have lots of nooks and crannies oftentimes that are easy for bats to get into. And a bat can get into a very small space. Just a quarter of an inch crevice is enough for a bat to get into. And so they squeeze in there. And then if it's a building, like imagine your attic, there's lots of different microclimates in there. Bats can go to the top if they want to be warm. They can move down to near the floor if they want to be cool. And you can fit lots of individuals in there. So this is great. You know, they have, they're very social. They talk to each other. They share information about where the good foraging habitats are. Mom can leave and go forage and leave her pup and know that, you know, her sister or her cousin is going to be there to help keep her pup warm while she's out foraging. So there's a lot of benefits to roosting in groups. And what we've seen is that as bats have moved into human structures, that they actually have roosted in larger and larger groups than what we ever would have seen in natural structures. And that's not necessarily a good thing for bats, actually, because there's more risk of transmission of disease between individuals or ectoparasites like the bat bugs that Katie mentioned uh, can build up in a roost. But with houses being so stable, offering so many opportunities, bats get attracted to them and then they, they swoop in there and they can use them all summer long and, and basically have all their needs met. So how do you discourage bats from roosting in your house? Well, you have to first figure out how they're getting in and, and, and keep them from getting in. And that's not always easy to do, but a, a thing I would advise is to watch the house at dusk. Bats are going to emerge to go feed. It's a rare day that a bat does not go out to eat. They need to eat every day on average. Uh, there might be a bat that would stay in one night, but usually they're gonna go out. And so if you watch, you can see the points where they're exiting. Now it's not advisable to exclude bats from a structure during the time when they have pups or when they might be pregnant because that could be uh, dangerous to the bats and bats have plenty of other uh, problems that they're facing. So we don't wanna you know, unnecessarily kill bats just because they're using a human structure. So the safest thing to do is to wait until the bats have left for the year, which would be during the winter, once the points where they're coming and going are identified. But you can also, uh, towards the end of the season, when the bats all are able to fly, the pups are able to fly, you can basically put up one-way exits where the bats can get out, but they can't get back in. And I can share a resource with you on how to exclude bats if you have a number of bats. If you just have one bat that gets into your house, like say you, you know, are watching TV and you look up and see a bat flying around in your living room, we advise, you know, turn off the lights, open the doors. Usually the bat will find its way out. They're echolocating and they can see the doorway and say, oh, I can get out here. And they don't want to be in, in your house any more than you want them to be in there. But if you find a bat, you know, on the curtain or something like that, you can either use a really thick glove to grab the bat. You don't want to touch the bat with your bare skin, uh, but you can grab the bat with a glove or you can use a shoe box, kind of tip the bat into the box, take it outside, put it at the base of a tree, they will just crawl right up and they'll get up in the branches and they'll take off, you know, when it's a safe time to do so. So that's how I'd advise getting out a single bat or if you have a large colony of bats, then you can exclude them yourselves. It sometimes is necessary to hire a professional depending on the magnitude of the issue. Yeah, I, I love, I like the idea of making sure consulting the professional just because they might understand the life cycle of the bat a little bit better and knowing what might be the most appropriate. So I, I'm curious, Joy, is um, is there a way or with your lab, is there like a contact if folks have questions about bats that they can uh, reach out to folks or is that uh, maybe contact their local extension office and we can get in touch with you? Yeah, you could definitely reach out to me via email and I can give you my email address so you can post that with the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but folks can also reach out to Extension. I'm eager to hear questions from folks about wildlife of any sort around the state, so I can know what kind of questions people have. And I've corresponded with people about geese and about snakes, but mostly about bats. Uh, so I would love to hear from people in any way that they choose. I'd rather have a snake in the house or a bat in the house? Uh... <laughs> I would oh, rather have a snake in the house, although that would probably mean that you had a mouse problem. But around Illinois, that's not uncommon. So snake is doing you a favor. Or in my parents' case, 
they don't have a mouse problem because they had a snake in the house. <laughs> right, right, right. So do we need to be alarmed if we have bats in our house or if we see them outside? Will they try to attack us or anything? So if you see bats in your house, uh, you know, especially if you see them in your living space, you do want to be cautious about that. Bats are a vector for rabies. They're one of um, a suite of mammals. The other ones are, are generally carnivorous that can transmit rabies and that can be a reservoir for rabies. And while it's very uncommon for a human to get, you know, rabies from a bat, that has happened. And in fact, it happened last year here in Illinois. And so if you have a bat in the room with you, you need to assume that that bat could bite you or if there is someone in the room who is not able to report adequately whether or not they've been bitten, then you may have to assume the CDC recommends that you assume that that person has been bitten by a bat. Uh, bats are very small, their teeth are very small. So it is possible that someone would not know that they had been bitten by a bat. That being said, like, like I said, the, the risk of getting rabies from a bat is very low. It's a very low percentage of the bats that actually get turned in. Less than 1% of the tested bats end up having uh, the rabies virus, but we do have to be careful. We don't want them in our living space. Even me who loves bats would not want you know, to share the, the space with bats besides the fact that they poop a lot because they eat so much. So you can have an accumulation of guano in your, in your living space. So uh, bats in the attic, less of a concern, but that accumulation of guano could be an issue. I worked with a, a church over in Terre Haute, Indiana that had bats in the belfry and they said, oh, it's fine. We don't mind at all. But I saw this growing pile of guano in their attic. And I said, this is eventually going to cave in your ceiling of your sanctuary. <laughs> You're going to have guano all over the pews. You know, you might want to deal with this. So, so that is a concern too. And, and there are probably ways you could deal with that. You need to be careful when working around guano because it can accumulate a fungus and cause a disease, histoplasmosis, especially for immunocompromised people who breathe it in just like you wouldn't want to sweep up rat droppings or mouse droppings um, without proper protection. Same thing is true with bats. But uh, in terms of seeing a bat outside, you know, I've seen bats uh, in planters, like in Chicago on the street. <laughs> I've seen bats uh, in, in uh, the cedar tree. We have a bat that roosted in the cedar tree in our yard on its migratory path. I've seen bats on the side of buildings many times. Uh, as they're migrating through Illinois or Indiana. And those bats, I'm not alarmed about, but a bat on the ground that's acting unusual, uh, you know, I would not encourage anyone to pick it up uh, because that bat could be ill and you wouldn't want to risk that you would get bitten by the bat. A trained professional, somebody who has the rabies vaccination like myself would be the best person to, to handle that bat and also to get it tested. So I discourage any, you know, kid or adult from picking up a bat um, if they're not tested. And it's going to be rare that you're going to see a bat outside. But, you know, if you do, then it would be good to report it to the health department or you could report it to your local extension office. So, Joy, did you get your rabies vaccine like because you're handling bats or was mm -hmm. there a significant like an incident that prompted it? So that's a good question. When we when we know that we're going to handle bats like you know, a lot of my students are becoming bat biologists, right? So we get the rabies series, which is a three-part vaccination series before we ever handle our first bat. That's standard practice for bat biologists. And if anybody is interested in working with bats and somebody tells you you don't need the rabies vaccine, then you should not work for them. Uh, that would be very unsafe. Uh, but um, at any rate, we get, the, we get those three shots. Um, and after about a month's worth of getting shots, you are protected but we get tested every year to see what our titer is for rabies. So basically how many antibodies do we have circulating in our bloodstream? And if it's really low, then we will go and get a booster shot, which is just one more of the same shot. If one of us gets bitten by a bat, we go and get two booster shots. And that just kind of ramps up your immune system, says, hey, rabies is here. Let's take a look at it and, you know, kind of Re, uh, be on a high alert. So then the immune system will be circulating, looking for the rabies that may have come from a wild bat that bit you. If you get bitten by a bat with no pre-exposure, then you're going to need four rabies shots and you're going to need four immunoglobulin shots. And the immunoglobulin is like a general immunity booster. 
So you get a combination of those and that should get your system in gear and help it to uh, handle the rabies that you may have, a, may have contracted from a wild animal, a bat or another animal. Uh, the person who died in Illinois last year refused to get the rabies shots after they, they had reported that they were bitten by a bat, bat was tested and found positive. And they said, well, you need to get the shots and the person refused and then they ended up dying of rabies. How soon after you get bit, do you need to go get tested or get at least to get um, your series of shots or start it? I, ideally, as soon as possible for us, it's within 48 hours after we get bitten, but we already have some immunity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just ideally as soon as possible. And sometimes the best practice is to test the bat first before starting the series, but uh, that's not always super fast. So, you know, it's going to depend. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there and not, it doesn't get, it's not something healthcare providers see very often. People you know, especially not in the U.S. where we have rabies really under control. So they don't see people who have been potentially exposed to rabies very often. And so I think, you know, what I've experienced as a bat biologist is that if I have a technician who needs to go get some extra shots, that there's a lot of confusion or um, lack of knowledge about what is the best possible path to take. And I always refer people to the CDC webpage. <laughs> it, it sort of reminds me that we had an entomologist and he would say uh, something like the, the the diagnosis of brown recluse bites in like Idaho, yet they've never found brown recluse in Idaho, but there's diagnosis for those bites all the time. So it's like uh, there is confusion about, you know, even uh, medically speaking, like is this is what is happening here? So Right, sure. And it can be difficult to tell. Like I mentioned, a bat bite is very small. Uh, you know, it'd just be like a briar scratch on your finger, for example. So you wouldn't necessarily know that you had been bitten by a bat to report it and to handle it effectively. Maybe I need to get a rabies series because I come away from being outdoors with all kinds of nicks and cuts and scratches and, <laughs> or camping even. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'll wake up from camping. Like, where did that come from? So yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You survived this long. So uh, I guess so. <laughs> Maybe you yeah. have immunity. Natural immunity. Uh, so you mentioned this a little bit earlier um, with kind of habitat destruction, uh, but how have humans affected bat populations kind of over time? So the, the main way that humans have affected bat populations is uh, by contributing to habitat loss. So bats, as I mentioned, are pretty dependent on trees. Many species in the United States and around the world depend on trees. And where we have cut trees down, we have taken away habitat for bats. Now, when we cut trees and allow them to regrow, then that's not the same as, you know, cutting the trees and putting in pavement. That's, those are two different things. But we have taken away a lot of the really large trees that bats, you know, almost all of the large trees that bats uh, would have evolved with. And we, we don't know what the impact has been to bats. Those big trees would have had lots of uh, nooks and crannies that bats could have roosted in and the foliage uh, would have been tremendous for those foliage dwelling bats. And of course, trees support insects. So uh, there's been potential impacts to bats foraging habitat through the loss of forests. Additionally, in Illinois, a large portion of the state was covered in prairie. And I'm sure you all have talked through the benefits of prairie to pollinators. And it actually hasn't been well studied how much bats use prairies, but I imagine it was quite a lot because I would think they're very productive ecosystems for bats in terms of insects. And probably with the array of plants that you could find in a prairie, there would always be food available for bats. So, so that probably has been a pretty big change to bats. And we don't know how bat populations have responded to those changes. We're not actually very good at measuring bat populations yet. Our best method is to go into caves or mines where bats are hibernating and to count the bats on the ceiling. And then to do that consistently from year to year or every other year, and then to look at traje trajectories for the population over time. But that only works for the bats that hibernate in caves and mines and not all of them do that. So still we have evidence that a lot of bats have undergone declines and that's probably due to these changes in habitat. Another way that humans are affecting bats is by introducing species that may be a threat to bats. So for example, the emerald ash borer 
has been marching across uh, from the east to the Midwest and destroying trees that were historically very good roosting habitat for bats, the ash trees. And while that ash borer does create dead trees that provide a temporary roost for bats, it's basically decimating a species that was really important for bats in the, uh, before the ash borer showed up. We also have seen that this fungus uh, somehow appeared in New York State back in the early 2000s. We first detected it the winter of 2006, 2007. We now think that this fungus may have existed in caves in Europe and Asia and that it was brought to the United States by people. And this fungus grows in this cold environment. It likes the cold, moist environment of these sites where bats hibernate. And our bats were totally naive to this fungus. They didn't know it. And as they were overwintering, the fungus started to grow on them and caused them to wake up repeatedly during the winter. And the fungus causes a syndrome we call white nose syndrome, where the bats have the fungus growing on their nose, on their wing membranes, and it is a bit necrotic on their tissue. So it eats through their tissue. And then the bat's immune system ramps up and tries to fight it off, and that causes additional stress to the bats. The bats wake up repeatedly through the winter, burn through their fat reserves, and bats uh, may starve during the winter or um, just experience so much damage to their wings that flight and, and energy balance and water balance is not possible because their wings are so disturbed. Um, bats can recover from white nose syndrome if they make it through the winter, but they do show tremendous fidelity to those sites. They'll go back the next year and they'll be exposed to that fungus again. That fungus has spread across much of the United States and Canada and has killed millions of bats uh, while they're hibernating. So we've seen a massive decline. Uh, one species, the northern long-eared bat, was listed as federally threatened back in 2015 because of the declines that it had experienced. And now, uh, just the other day, last week actually, the US Fish and Wildlife Service announced that they're probably going to list that species as federally endangered because across its range, we've seen numerous instances of it experiencing a 97 to 100% decimation of its populations. It used to be the most common bat that I captured working in the Eastern US and now we don't see it if, if ever, you know, like we might see one or two in a summer um, or none. So we have affected bats by changing their habitats, by bringing in invasive species, and by making changes to their habitats that are barriers. So another uh, example is where we have put up um, obstructions in the landscape. So wind energy is one of those things that has been a, a problem for bats. Some of the bats that live in Illinois don't hibernate in caves and mines, but instead migrate long distances to the south. I don't actually know where they go, uh, but we know that they move through in great numbers um, and they're moving in the spring and in the fall. And during those periods, those migratory bats are running into wind turbines and dying in rather large numbers. And because we don't, they don't aggregate in the winter, we don't actually know what their population sizes are, but there has been an estimate that the hoary bat, which is our largest bat in Illinois, and one of those long distance migrants, that that bat could go extinct by 2050 due to the uh, impacts of wind turbines across North America. And wind turbines are a problem for bats around the world, so not just here in North America. And so that, that's another issue. Um, so basically bats are, are really facing a lot of, a lot of human threats, uh, but we have a lot of control over those things. So that's great news. We can, we can change those things and we already have. Uh, the wind energy industry has been tremendous in trying to fund research into ways to minimize impacts to bats. Uh, so that's great. And, and people think a lot more favorably about bats than they used to, especially here in North America, even despite uh, the coronavirus, which has been linked to bats. Uh, we see that people generally think a lot more favorably about bats. They realize that bats have an important role in our ecosystem health. And so that's great because that means that people will, you know, get behind measures that can support healthy bat populations. And we see that time and time again. How many bat species do we have in Illinois? So 13 to 14 depends. There's a uh, one species, the free-tailed bat that occasionally pops into Illinois. Uh, it's not established here yet, but otherwise um, the other species are distributed 
mostly in Southern Illinois. We get all the bat species that occur in Illinois are in Southern Illinois where we have a lot of forests and we have the caves. And then we get a few that also occur, uh, the same species that it will occur in Northern Illinois. So where the diversity of habitats is greatest is where we see the greatest diversity of bats. How many of them stick around or first migrate? So the migratory bats would be the hoary bat, silver-haired bat, and the um, eastern red bat. Those are our long distance migrants, but all the bats move some distance between their summer and their winter habitat. Perhaps our most sedentary bats include like the uh, big brown bat, which is our most common bat in Illinois. It may move from your attic in the summer to the church attic in the winter. <laughs> you know, just uh, just across the street or, you know, whatever. We don't know uh, where a lot of big browns spend the winter. We see them sometimes in caves and mines, but more often than not, we don't see them. And so uh, we know that they're probably using human structures and there has been some work in, in Indiana to show that. A couple of other species are probably fairly sedentary. Uh, the, well, three, the gray bat, which is a federally endangered species that uh, uses caves only and sometimes hibernates in the very same cave where it spends the summer uh, raising its pups or pup. And then the, um, the southeastern myotis, which is very closely related to the gray bat, is another species that either moves between caves and caves, so we use the same cave. I've been in a couple caves in southern Illinois that serve as both the summer and the winter site, uh, or they move between trees and caves. And then the raffinesque big-eared bat is another species that also would just move very short distances between those structures. And those three species are all only in Southern Illinois. They don't, they don't seem to move up into Northern Illinois really, but all the rest of the species are kind of moderate distance migrants. Like the Indiana bat might migrate from a mine up in um, LaSalle down to uh, right around here, around Champaign County, and then go back to that mine. Or they might migrate from a mine and, or a cave in Southern Illinois up to you know east of St. Louis and then move back down to that hibernation site. Curious, Joy, how has um, COVID-19 played a role in some of your research? Because I've worked with a few conservation groups and for like certain grants and things, they have to monitor bat populations and they haven't been able to do any netting recently. Mm -hmm. um, has that impacted your research in these last couple of years? So in 2020, every bat biologist in the country was put on hold for a little while at least. And then various states changed their measures and allowed bat handling, um, sometimes only when absolutely necessary and other times not at all. And so for our projects, we basically curtailed netting of bats in 2020. And, but that didn't turn us off entirely because there's still other things we can do. We can do acoustic surveys for bats. Bats are always out echolocating. And that's great because we can eavesdrop on them, so to speak, by putting out uh, bat detectors and listening for their calls and recording them. And it's not as good as getting a bat in the hand when you're trying to identify the species, but it's, it's pretty close and it'll give you a lot of information. So acoustics is a really powerful way to study bats. So we were still able to do that in uh, 2020. And then we also went back to some of the trees that we had tracked bats to earlier in 2019 to see if bats were still using those structures. And that was really informative for us as well. And so we still were able to carry on to some degree. Uh, but then in 2021, we resumed our normal activities. What we do differently is that now we wear a mask when we are handling bats. And there was concern that we would actually transfer the coronavirus to our native bat populations because uh, it didn't originate here in North America. And we think that our bats might be naive to it. Coronavirus has been detected in a lot of different wildlife, including white-tailed deer. And so we suspect that it's, you know, it's out there and bats mm -hmm. could be exposed to it. There's a lot of folks looking into bat health now um, as an outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I expect that we'll learn a lot more about the viruses that are present in our bat populations and how you know, risky those might be to us in, in North America, uh, but also how risky they might be to the bats themselves. And another question too about tree species. Now, uh, a long time ago, it seems like when I did a different job um, and we were doing habitat analysis for Indiana brown bat for a development project, um, 
we were specifically looking for silver maples. Are there particular species of trees that you look for when maybe I try to identify like the ideal roosting spot for a, a, a bat when it comes to trees? Sure. So, so Indiana bats do roost in dead trees. And if you look in a particular region, you may see some preferences. For example, here in the Midwest, cottonwoods are a, a great species for Indiana bats. They tend to be very large, they grow very quickly, they occur in streamside areas, and so they're near good foraging habitat. They have thick pieces of bark that when the tree dies, uh, creates a big you know, patch that the bats can roost under and you can fit 100 or even more bats under a piece of bark in a cottonwood tree. But there are other species that are really popular for use by bats here in the Midwest. Elms and ashes were historically good trees, as well as certain kinds of oak trees. I watched 375 bats come out of a poplar, a dead poplar in Southern Illinois a couple years ago. So that's pretty exciting. But when you move to other parts of the country, you'll see that they use different species. So I did a big study on the Indiana bat in the Southern Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina and Tennessee. And there they used almost exclusively yellow pine trees. So pitch pine, Virginia pine, uh, shortleaf pine and, and table mountain pine. And those trees are quite different in structure, but what we see is that they, when they die, they create a tall uh, structure that has a lot of solar exposure on it because the crown dies and then there's sun on the tree. They get fairly tall and they have nice platy patches of bark that the bats can roost underneath. And so with repeated studies on Indiana bats across you know, the Eastern United States, what we found is that they're not keying in on the tree species so much as on the tree structure. And that tree structure can be repeated across different species of trees. So there's a lot of trees that can provide good habitat for Indiana bats or any other species. And I think, you know, if you're trying to promote good bat habitat, having a diversity of trees is, is going to be a good way to do that. So the next couple questions, Joy, I, um, this is a bit different. I asked my children what they wanted to know about bats. Um, and I'll be honest, they watched this cartoon called Bluey. It's like, a, it's from Australia. So that was mostly about fruit bats, but I was like, try to think about Illinois. Um, so, so they kind of reframed their questions a little bit, but so I'm gonna ask you this first one from my 10 year old. And um, he was just wondering why are, is, is there a reason that has been determined why bats come out at nighttime? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, you know, there's 13 or 14 species of bats we will uh, see in Illinois, but there are hundreds of species of birds in Illinois, right? And mm -hmm. birds really dominate the sky. I mean, all day long, if you walk around the neighborhood, you're going to see crows and robins and cardinals and, you know, the occasional red-tailed hawk uh, flying around. So the, the airspace is pretty well taken up by a lot of other animals. And also uh, some of those animals would eat bats. And bats aren't particularly good flyers compared to birds. They're not as strong at flight uh, for the most part. And so they tend to be a little bit more awkward. And, and so they're easy prey for birds. Even a bird that wouldn't normally eat other animals, like say a blue jay, would eat a bat, no problem. And so it's risky for bats to be out during the day. So they would tend to want to come out at night. And they do have to strike a balance because when they come out at night, they want to take advantage of those insects. Most bats, as I mentioned, around the world eat insects, and all of our bats here in Illinois eat insects. And they're going to, the insects or populations are going to be at their peak right at dusk. You know, that's kind of a, a good time for insects to be busy because the daytime predators are slowing down and the nighttime predators haven't really kicked in yet. And so uh, the insects are also trying to strike a balance. So bats have to play uh, a game of, you know, do I want to come out and eat more insects, but possibly get eaten, or do I want to wait a little while and come out after dusk? So uh, we actually had a study we did in Indiana where we looked at when bats emerged relative to sunset, and we found that lactating females who were feeding their young and who were presumably the most energetically stressed of the bats that we were looking at, they would come out closer to sunset. Whereas once a bat was finished feeding her young and she was post lactating, uh, she would come out later, about 10 minutes later than the, the lactating bats. So, so they come out at night to eat insects and to not get eaten themselves. And as I mentioned earlier, bats do eat other things besides 
insects and even our insectivorous bats will occasionally take other types of prey like uh, the hoary bat, which is our biggest bat in Illinois, has on a few occasions been seen eating another bat. There are some bats that are so small that a hoary bat might perceive it as a really big juicy moth and then it gets it in its mouth. It's like, oh, that's a bat actually. Okay, well, I'll eat that too, <laughs> you know? And the, uh, the pallid bat that lives out West in, in uh, the United States and Canada, the pallid bat has been seen getting into cactus flowers and actually eating the fruit uh, inside the cactus. So they, they dig in, even though this is an insectivore that will take um, insects off the ground as well as centipedes, uh, they'll grab centipedes off the ground. It's a pretty cool bat, but they will also um, eat basically fruit and, and the, the juices of a, of a flower. And, and then my eight-year-old, his question, well, I mean, so we he knows about fruit bats from the cartoon, um, and he knows about our kind of Illinois bats because we see them all the time. We talk about how they eat insects, but he still he doesn't understand why are bats tied to Count Dracula. Um, mm -hmm. he, so, uh, Joy, I don't know if you could just humor him. What, what's, the, what's the connection there? Right. So Dracula, I think, represents people's fear of the night and people's fear of the unknown, you know, dark. I mean, you can imagine uh, before we had all this light available to mm -hmm. us. And now I have a bulb that changes colors and I can just yep. use a little remote control to get whatever light I want. But that didn't used to be a thing. And so people really probably were a lot more fearful of what was going on in the night. And it's right about that time that Dracula was introduced as a character and capitalizing on those fears you know, that people have. And that speaks to a bigger issue with bats and with a lot of other wildlife, which is that we fear what we don't understand. And bats being nocturnal, active at night, cryptic, they're really difficult to see. Most of our bats in Illinois are brown and camouflaged and they hide really well. You wouldn't even necessarily see one on the tree if you walked past a tree and there was a bat there. And, and then they are um, really small too. So we don't know a lot about them. Even bat biologists like me are just constantly asking questions like, I don't know this about bats and I wish I knew, you know? So the average person just probably doesn't know a lot about bats, which is why I'm always so excited to talk to people about bats because I can hopefully help spread some knowledge and allay some fears and get people excited about these really cool critters because then, you know, they'll help with uh, conserving them and their habitats. But when we think about, um, you know, bats and Dracula, I think that just speaks to that fear we have of the unknown. So I think kind of stepping out into the night and, you know, making some observations of bats, like Katie talked about seeing them when she's out on a run or a walk, uh, that's a great thing to do. And you, then you get a better understanding of what are bats and what are they doing. And one way I like to do that is I like to take uh, bat walks with the public. So I've done a couple around here in Champaign and Urbana, going out with a bat detector and listening to bats as they're echolocating. And that just opens up a world for folks because, you know, we don't hear bats. They call at a frequency that's above the range of human hearing. And so they're out there in the night sky and we have sometimes no idea that they're there. But a bat detector can open a window to, to show you that there are bats active in your neighborhood or in your park and to give you an understanding of, you know, how valuable they are in your ecosystem. Improving that bat PR. I love that. So just, yeah, it's kind of like Jaws too. It's like, people just they don't understand that unknown thing uh, so yeah that that's perfect and so okay one last question joy and we'll let you go um wanted to know about the swooping to the head towards the head because it, it, maybe when you're out doing your bat walks or i've even demonstrated with the kids you know if you throw up uh, like a piece like a leaf or a chunk of grass or something they'll swoop down after it and then you hear people talk about them getting tangled in hair why are they swooping down towards our heads? Is there a reason for that? Right. Well, you might have noticed when you're out at night that the insects like to swarm around your head. Um, midge flies and mosquitoes will swarm around people. They're attracted to our CO2 and they know that we're a good source of food uh, for them in the form of blood. <laughs> and so uh, they're coming down to, to prey on you. And the bats, if they are swooping near a person's head, they're interested in those insects. That would be the only reason that a bat would come near your head. You know, the bats are actually echolocating on their prey, which means sending out uh, short pulses of high frequency sound 
they use a rapid repetition rate. They make many, many, many sounds over and over and over. And those notes bounce off of insects in the air. And a bat is actually able to, in just a matter of seconds, grab an insect out of the air um, and consume it. They often grab the insect with their tail and then they will eat the insect out of their tail or they'll just run into it full frontal and then just grab the insect as it starts to fall um, out of the sky. And they have to consume a lot of insects. So they're constantly out there echolocating and they will, as I mentioned, come down if you have a lot of insects around your head to take advantage of that swarm of insects. If you throw a rock or a leaf up in the air, a bat may mistake that for a rather large insect that it wants to come after. And they're not super discriminating about what they eat. I've had a couple of students do diet studies on bats now. And what we find is that they eat, they mainly are selecting based on size. So what can I easily consume? And then beyond that, they don't care. They're eating moths, they're eating beetles, they're eating flies, they're eating uh, you know, spiders occasionally roaches, <laughs> just whatever they can, whatever they can find and stuff into their little mouths. One more quick question. Sorry. So when they're echolocating, can they like tell the difference between theirs and others? Like, do they have unique sounds kind of like human voice where we all sound a little bit different? We, we haven't picked up on individual calls when we're looking at echolocating bats, but we do know that socially they can discern each other. And bats have a lot of social calls that they make, especially in the roost. But um, it's it's likely that they can tell you know each other. And bats will change their voices a little bit to accommodate for the fact that they're foraging in a space with other bats because it can be hard to hear your own echoes if you have the echoes from another bat uh, nearby. So they do they do modify sometimes their echo location echo location calls, dropping them in frequency or increasing them so that the echoes that come back are a little bit different than the neighbor's echoes. And bats will chase each other out of airspace and they also compete for prey. So I have a colleague who works out in the desert Southwest who gets up on a gigantic platform and watches bats as they fly in the sky and go after insects. And he sees that one bat will try to jam the other bat's echo location call so that then the bat can swoop in and grab the prey item that the other bat was after. So they, they are definitely listening to each other and, and responding accordingly. Fascinating. That, I mean, it is so interesting. There, I, there's so much more to it also. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, I, I was listening to a podcast all about how dolphins communicate too. And it's just like, I feel like we're, we're scratching the surface here on how, <laughs> how wildlife talk to each other. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, this was a lot of great information. So uh, Dr. Joy O'Keefe, Assistant Professor and Wildlife Extension Specialist, thank you so much for being on the show today. Sure, no problem. Thanks for having me. I'd be happy to come anytime. And I love talking about bats. So I'll give you my email address if folks want to reach out with questions. We will put that email address in our show notes and be careful what you wish for because we had a Dr. Ward on here about snakes and the questions started coming in. <laughs> so yeah. uh, yep, that might happen. Yeah. So the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson. And this, this week, it's edited by me, Chris Enroth. A special thanks to our co-host with us every single week, Katie Parker, Ken Johnson. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Joy, and uh, for sharing all that great information. And Chris and Ken, it's always good to see you guys. Yes, thank you, Joy. It was very interesting. And Chris and Katie, thank you as always. Chris, go check on those plants and mm -hmm. let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We're going to be talking with Dr. Casey Athey with a series about insects, the good, the bad, and the ugly, or as Ken would say, the lovely. Uh, so listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.